Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Hudson Library and Historical Society's virtual streaming event with Andrea Pitzer. I'm Kathy, one of the adult services librarians here at the library. And before we begin, I'd like to go over a couple of quick housekeeping items. At any time during the discussion, you're welcome to submit your questions to the author. To do so, just type your questions into the Q&A at the bottom of the control panel, and we'll get to as many of your questions as time allows. If you're having technical issues with Zoom, this program is also being live streamed on Facebook, so you can access it there. Also, if you're interested in purchasing Andrea's book from our local independent bookstore, The Learned Owl, there will be a link in the chat for you to do so. Now, I'm delighted to introduce our guests for this evening. Andrea Pitzer is a journalist whose writing has appeared in the Washington Post, The Daily Beast, The New York Review of Books, Outside, Vox, and Slate, among other publications. She has authored two previously critically acclaimed books, One Long Night and The Secret History of Vladimir Nabokov. She received an undergraduate degree from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and later studied at MIT and Harvard as an affiliate of the Nyman Foundation for Journalism. Our moderator tonight is Beth Macy, the author of three New York Times bestselling books, including her most recent, Dope Stick, Dealers, Doctor, and the drug company that addicted America. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Andrea Pitzer and Beth Macy. Thank you so much. It's, it's great to be with um, my fellow Ohioans. Um, I'd like to start by just saying a little bit about Andrea and this book, and then I'm gonna, um, she's gonna play a little clip from a radio story uh, of some audio video that she shot when she was in um, Russia. Um, but I first wanna start by saying she isn't only the author of three critically acclaimed books telling untold histories. Andrea is literally in my mind, a kind of action hero. She's a superhuman athlete. She's a black belt, by the way, a superhuman Renaissance woman. Uh, she writes liner notes in her spare time for major recording artists. A superhuman journalist whose latest essays uh, have been published recently in the New York Review of Books, Outside Magazine, uh, and The Post, among others. Right now, she's learning to dry suit scuba dive, and she's learning Russian while raising her two children and um, being married to a fabulous husband and, all, and caregiving her mother. Uh, she's the founding um, editor of the website Neiman Storyboard, which is how we met. Um, I was a Neiman fellow at Harvard a year after or two years after she and her husband Dan. And um, I had nobody really in, in my circle has taught me as much about narrative storytelling as Andrea. And just most importantly, she's a really dear friend who thinks of nothing of staying up until two in the morning, if it means helping me and probably a passel full of other writers, uh, fine tune a piece. So um, she's good people. Um, and this book is a really good book. Uh, I think we're just start off um, with a clip from her third trip, not her first or her second, but her third trip uh, to Russia, um, which an excerpt of which played on Here and Now last week in the NPR program. If you wanna set it up a little bit. So uh, we got to the place um, in the Arctic where William Barents and his men, the subject of this book, Icebound, saw their first walruses. And their response to the walruses was to climb over to the side in their small boats and go try to kill them all because they had heard that the tusks were valuable. Uh, this is what we did instead. We came to exactly the same place. And amazingly, more than 400 years later, saw hundreds of walruses in exactly the same place. And uh, here is what happened.
And I'll stop there because what we uh, what we did was put on a walrus concert and they loved it. And it was one of the best things of all the research for this book. I was so delighted that, that we were able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I got goosebumps just like watching it again just now. What must it have felt like for you to be in the exact same place where this person whose head you had spent so much time trying to get in and so many documents? I mean, what was that moment like? Because you didn't know it was going to happen, right? No, there were any number of times where, I mean, you know, if it were just a question of writing the history, I'd like to think I'm a great writer and I could write it better than anybody else. And, but realistically, there's a lot of people, you know, Dutch people who have studied this history for 40 years and are probably going to know it in a way that I might not ever know it unless I spent 40 years. But for me, what I try to do with a book often is to be in a place and then use that to bring something to readers that maybe they wouldn't have. So this was just fantastic. We also saw a mirage, which was a little different from, but uh, was also a polar mirage. And Barents and his crew had seen this amazing mirage when they were there. Our engine broke down and we had to sail back on sails alone on pretty much the same route that Barents and had men had, his men had used. And I joked with the crew that I was like, you know, responsible. And then they came up with the story I'd thrown in a wrench in the engine to make it happen because I was the only one that was happy that the engine broke. But I was like, yes, this is just that much closer to what they experienced. And the closer I can get, the, the more I can tell that story for readers. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, what, I mean, a lot of things happen. I find if you just go out and put yourself in the situations and in the places that you said, you, you, you're amazed at what can happen that, that can parallel your themes in the story. Um, it's just such a cool example. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, just to, to kind of ground readers with, with your history, like kind of if we could stand back for the satellite view, which you're so good at doing in your books. Um, and in just a few minutes, could you tell us exactly how you got from West Virginia, where you grew up in a little mountain town, to the shores of Nova Zimbla? And, 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 um. and, and, and don't tell me the bio <laughs> version. Tell me the tell me the real you story. So the real me is I had a pretty tough childhood, um, but uh, it was pretty violent childhood. It was a pretty poor childhood, but I had a set of grandparents that owned a bookstore and the bookstore, they lived above it. So when I went to visit them, I could go down the back steps and just wander the bookstore at night at will. And, and it had big glass panes. So there would be streetlights, you know, and I could read there and they had a couple signings um, before I remembered I was too young. They had Gore Vidal there, uh, which was kind of a shocker, but they also just had a guy who wrote kind of episodes for Wild Kingdom and he had written some adventure books and I met him and he was just a regular guy, right? He's just a guy who writes books. And I started thinking, you know, maybe I could write books. And so ever since I was really young in my head, it was something I wanted to do. Um, the, my school in Parkersburg, uh, West Virginia, was a pretty good school. We had a gifted program. I went to the Model UN, and it was hosted by Georgetown University. And so I, even though I was quite poor, I could imagine a sort of a scholarship path, and I worked full-time while I was in college, and I went to Georgetown. I could imagine getting there because I had met people from there. You know, it was, a, it was a way I could, like, picture myself getting there. And then after that, it only took me about 20 years and a black belt and some diversions and, you know, to other things to sort of get to the heart of what I'd actually studied when I was in college, which was humanities and international affairs. And all three of my books have really been about this sort of global history and big events, uh, you know, colonialism or concentration camps or the Russian Revolution, but trying to find these really intimate often creative or scientific journeys that happen for individuals inside those big moments. And I try to balance out the really personal, uh, intimate stories with the big sweep of what's happening in the world at the time. And so to get to Nova Zembla, I, um, I thought, you know, if I'm gonna write this book, and I've been thinking for more than a decade that I wanted to tell the story of Embarrance and his men, but I didn't wanna tell it unless I could actually be in the places they'd been because I didn't think that there was enough 400 year old history, if you've ever tried to write history, is, is pretty far back. You know, there's, there's not the kinds of newspapers that we would expect now. There's not photos, uh, letters may or may not have survived depending on how important you are. All the stuff that if you're writing 20th century history, you can pretty much grab hold of for a lot of different people just aren't there. And so I wanted to have that experience. And so it, it took some doing, I kind of for seven years 
noodled around trying to figure out a way to get there. And then it just sort of fell in my lap and I jumped at the chance. And what was the first time that you heard this story? Wasn't there a connection between your Nabokov book and this one? Yeah, so um, my first book was about Vladimir Nabokov, the guy who wrote Lolita, which is what he's most famous for. And in another one of his books, there was a mystery kingdom called Zembla. And it's kind of hard to figure out in the novel, what is that supposed to be? And that's one of the things I wanted to get to. So I started looking it up and I found these islands of Nova Zembla that were a couple hundred miles north of Siberia. And I started looking into the history of that. And I found just a really short little summary of this story. And I thought, these Dutchmen, you know, a group of Dutchmen 400 years ago, trying to get from Amsterdam to China, getting stranded for the winter. And how would they even survive? I mean, there's no REI, no GPS. They were literally <laughs> off every map that was made. I mean, that nobody knew where they were. And if they were gonna survive, it had to entirely be on them. There was not gonna be any rescue. And I just thought, what a survival story and why didn't I know it? So for 10, 12 years, I looked into it. When I researched my concentration camp book, uh, I went into Europe through Amsterdam on purpose and went to the Rijksmuseum to see the relics that they had been retrieved from their cabin hundreds of years later. And to just, you know, I just gathered string and like sort of kept bits of things. And then after I finished the camp's book, there was also a part of me that said, you know, concentration camps on six continents is enough. I wanna go somewhere. There were no concentration camps. I wanna go somewhere and do something quite different to sort of, to, to a little bit recuperate from the ordeal of writing that book. But I still wanted to tell an important story. And I think this is still an important historical story that has meaning today too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, uh, the coda brings it so perfectly together. It had been a while since I had read that and rereading it last night. You were, you bring us right into the moment of this day, which reminded me that I think at the beginning when you first started this, that you were considering, we're, we're gonna geek out on craft a little bit here, if y'all don't mind. Uh, weren't you considering sort of telling, doing a double narrative with the reverse of how global warming was impacting it and then this, and maybe you could talk about that and then why you decided to structure it the way you did. Well, there's a reason we have editors, <laughs> I will say, <laughs> and um, I want, I originally was thinking of doing a super ambitious structure that would move like an alternating chapters forward and backward in time and sort of uh, this sort of loop that would explain how all this Arctic exploration, while these other things were happening in the world brought us to this moment of climate change that we're at. And I think um, it, I think it, it was hard for editors to picture how that would work exactly. And I still felt like I could do it, but I think it would have been a lot harder for readers to come along and to understand. So in the end, I'm basically planning on writing three books. <laughs> and so it'll be, you know, it'll be at least the Arctic trilogy, but with the idea of using this history but kind of bringing it into the present with each book, but in, in different ways. And so yeah. I think uh, that that sometimes it's good to start really ambitious. And then when you trim it back, you still have a really interesting book. Uh, and I, I, I think it's, you should never start out timid. You know, you should always sort of go for more than you think you can do and then figure out what to take away. And so this was an example where that's what we did with the structure of the book. Yeah, and then you come up with an idea for two more books. And I, I want to mention your outside piece. What month did that run? Uh, I think it ran in June um, or July. I think one in print and then one online. So it was, but it's it's on the outside website still. Of 2020. And that's kind of the personal story of your trip. And it's such a different kind of writing from in the book that I think if you're interested in this topic, you should also uh, Google that story because it's it's really amazing as well and it's going to be a little bit more like kind of what you're aiming at next if I'm right. Right, so it'll be a little bit more what the next book is likely to be like. It's called My Midlife Crisis as a Russian Sailor. So, <laughs> so with something that happened in the 16th century, not that long after the Gutenberg press was invented, um, how did you go about finding source materials? I know there were, I know there was a memoir or two 
but I mean, I'm assuming you also contacted living historians as well, but, but, but you didn't quote them very often. So you, so you made some real editorial choices uh, uh, that led you to have this kind of authoritative suite. But I know just like, it's like the tip of the iceberg, uh, 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 not to put too fine a point on, on the ice, but so much work underneath. Can, can you talk about all the work underneath that allowed you to have this author authoritative voice? Sure. So what I knew from the beginning was that there was an account that was published shortly after all this happened. Um, it was such an amazing thing that people would go and spend the winter in this place and come back. It, it came to really define the entire idea of the, the polar north. I mean, it, it Zembla, Nova Zembla became like a symbol of this. It got translated into five languages very shortly after they returned, multiple printings in some of these editions. Shakespeare references them in his play, Twelfth Night. I mean, they were Dutch, he was English. So it wasn't even like he was from the same country. It was a story that was broadly known. And I, I had read that journal that was kept, uh, that, that uh, someone who went on the second and third voyage with William Barents and then kind of got a summary of the first voyage. So that was in existence, but the English is not something most people would read in a weekend. It's stilted, it's from 400 years ago. And uh, there were also some disciplinary records. There's a mutiny that's not mentioned in that journal that, uh, that there were uh, disciplinary records that somebody else had already found and identified and highlighted. And How did you get onto also, that? How did you get onto um, well, that? I was at the, um, the, Mar the Maritime Museum in Amsterdam and it's even, I mean, it's, it's referenced widely. It's been known for more than 100 years, but this is something that somebody already sort of piled in. But when I was at the Maritime Museum, I had a chance to talk more with some of the archivists there about that. And also, uh, they have a whole library of materials, you know, from this era and to interview them. And, and there's a paper from Diedrich Wildemann, who's quoted, uh, they're cited a few times in Endnotes, who actually looked into this identity of what we know about William Barents. Um, and I also, again, uh, bothered the Rijksmuseum on a second trip, and this time the curator from the 16th century, uh, their holdings, took me to their depot. And I have to say, it was uh, very different than the walrus thing, which was also one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. But this was, I will probably never see anything like this again. I went into their underground holdings, not even like in the main city. We went to another town, I won't say where it is, and I'm walking through and there are like, gilt swords inlaid with jewels and like royal like ball gowns and crowns and all these like alarmed glass cases and we're walking I felt like I was in a heist movie or something you know it's so dramatic <laughs> but working with these curators so I spent time in archives looking at things I also found and it wasn't a secret but there was a man who had been on two of the voyages with Barrett's the first two who was not particularly a fan of him who had also kept a journal of those two voyages, but it had never been translated into English. So I went to the Library of Congress and found two things. I found the original Old Dutch and I had somebody translate it for me. And I also found a French version so that I could just read it on my own because I can read French. So I could just read it on my own while this person was translating and at least start working it into my story. But then for accuracy, refer later to what she would get translated. But it wasn't just this archival stuff and talking to these historians, which was definitely a big part of it. It was also, there was a replica of the ship being built uh, in Harlingen at the time. And so I went up and luckily it was in the water by the time I got there, the masts weren't in it, but I could go below decks and I could see what space they were in, how many steps it was, where the cargo would have been, because we have these really precise illustrations from the era. And I could also then interview the, uh, the guy who's in charge of designing and building that. And so I could ask him a lot of questions as well. I also learned how to use the navigation equipment that my sailors used from 400 years ago. Now, if you relied on me to get you across the Atlantic or home from the Arctic, you would probably be in real trouble, but I understood well enough the principles of how they used it. And so in addition to the experience of going there, I really try to sort of pull in things from as many places as possible. Yeah, uh, 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 just so hard because you didn't have, um, I mean, I, I know your narrative writing style, that you would have loved to interview Barents himself or had to have like the more personal details of the main three guys, right? Um, was that the biggest challenge to you? It was, and it's interesting. The, the book has been really positively reviewed and the couple like small knocks it's gotten have just been that I didn't explore the interior lives more. And it's funny because I felt 
there were times where I felt I was being very weepily sentimental, like about the suffering that they were having. But it, I didn't feel as somebody who has a journalistic background, writing a nonfiction book, I didn't feel like I could invent their feelings. There were places where it said, and we were terrified or, and you know, I could extrapolate sometimes from that, but I, I didn't want to invent where I didn't have material. I didn't want to describe it a different way or paraphrase if they didn't have some indication of what they were thinking or feeling. And to me, an inch of ice, more than an inch of ice on the inside of your cabin, a raging polar bear on your roof, ripping the planking off, um, uh, people poisoning themselves by burning coal in their cabin, uh, skin peeling off after they eat polar bear liver. To me, like, we know how we would feel in these circumstances <laughs> that, that there's enough, but, but yes, it was a challenge. And I really embraced that challenge. I wanted to, to have this idea. Sometimes I think with these polar stories, and I talk about this a little in the book, we create these kind of legendary heroes and we suffer inside their minds and they write these details, these personal details. And I think there's something very dangerous about uh, turning people into heroes. And part of what I try to do with this book is actually make Barents like small and human again, because I think it's so much more extraordinary if it's somebody that's like you and me, and really people are like you and me. We just turn them into something bigger after they do something amazing, but they really are the same. And so I wanted to take this back from being a legend and make it the story of these people caught up in a huge history around them, trying to go all the way to China, completely ill-equipped to spend a winter anywhere, um, not really picking up clues from the indigenous people they see a little further south before they're stranded so far north, and, and yet, they persevere. So, you know, it, to me, it was making them sort of human size again. Oh, that's amazing. Um, I've got three favorite details. I just want to ask you, because I'm the interviewer and I can, uh, where'd you get them? Because they're just okay. great. The ravens that uh, some other sailors took with them so they could see where land was. That is just like a classic literature. That is a story from Viking literature that, okay. that these three ravens were sent up. And this is one of the ways, but it's not the only one. I mean, we think about in the Bible, the doves being sent. And yeah. so that it's, um, it was a method of early navigation that if you sent a bird up, if it turned around and went back the other way, then you were still close enough to where you came from or some kind of land behind you, not in the direction you wanted to go, that, you know, that it was gonna go there. If you threw the bird up and it went around in circles for a while and came back down, then you knew you weren't near any land for it to go to. But if you put it up in the air and it flew forward the direction you wanted to go and didn't return, there was a very good shot that there was land in that direction. And so birds were used in a variety of cultures as an early navigation device. But that's a, um, uh, that epic, which I'm not even gonna be able to pronounce the name of, <laughs> so I'm not gonna try, <laughs> but is a, a pretty famous Viking epic. Uh, in, in the search, the expansion that happened out from Europe uh, over to Iceland and then to North America, we learned much later, of course. You must have read so many books in the research for this. Just, you're, it's an expert on shipbuilding, navigation. Well, what's funny here is you talk about the authoritative voice. Well, there's a lot, but when you talk about this authoritative voice and it's like, there's some things where somebody would tell me very definitively this is true, we know this is true, we know this name or we know this place. And I would look at the evidence and they know far more than I do, but I would say, I'm not convinced. And I would talk to somebody else and they would say, we don't know that. And they would know just as much, but a slightly different basket of things. And so sometimes I would make the call to say, we don't know, knowing that some of your sources are gonna be unhappy that you didn't say it was the thing that they said. And so I tried to be honest in the book with the things that maybe we have an idea of, but that we don't know. And I think that's again, you know, maybe somebody who didn't have a background in journalism would feel more inclined to just pick something and go with it. But I really felt like where it's still up in the air, we kind of have to let it be up in the air. And sometimes that can be part of the story as well. Uh, the, the real visceral detail of them getting polar bear liver poisoning. Um, can, can you say where you got that detail from? It was probably from the journal, but, but, but kind of maybe just tell that story. So uh, they had tried polar bear once early on and they didn't like the taste of it. It just wasn't a pleasant meat. And they were catching foxes and the foxes actually had a little vitamin C. They can synthesize their own vitamin C. So that was actually what's keeping them from dying of scurvy over the winter, though they didn't know it because there's no greenery up there for them to be eating. So they were catching and eating these foxes in between blizzards 
And um, then they were kind of lean on them and they ended up with a polar bear and they were so hungry, uh, they decided to go ahead and eat it, but they ate the liver, which is just chock full of vitamin A. So they got hypervitaminosis A. And in the book, it says their skin peeled off from head to toe. And it's funny, every time I was editing the manuscript, I'm like, I must have exaggerated that. And I would go back and look in the journal. It's like, no, that's what they said. And when I was doing the research for the background research, I looked it up and it's it's one of the, the many, many symptoms of it. It's not unusual. It can still happen today. You have to have a lot of uh, vitamin A to do that. And polar bear is one of the sources that, that causes that. But it's actually... Um, you know, it, it's not hard to find at all, but it's one of those stories, if you don't know to go look for it, then it's, uh, it's, you know, it's this freak medical thing from 400 years ago that I at first thought might not be true, but it was absolutely what happens if you eat a polar bear liver. <laughs> Good to know. Who knew? So if you're ever with a polar bear, don't eat the liver. That's the exactly. Thing. Might be the juiciest. And then how did you come up with the line where you call him near the end, the patrons? And this is, I love the way you sort of talk about the legend too. The line that he is the patron saint of devoted error. I just thought, I mean, part of what I talk about is how he, I mean, he became famous. They really, I mean, I'm not in Shakespeare's plays. You're not in Shakespeare's plays. A lot of people aren't in Shakespeare's plays, but these guys are. And so like, how did that happen? You know, I, I wanted to get into that idea, um, but it's, uh, it's this, first face of the polar explorer is what he becomes. And it's not really to the 19th century. So, you know, three centuries later that we see it sort of really take root and become what we think of today with Nansen and, and Shackleton and, you know, and some guys that were before them that become sort of these, these burly guys that the whole goal is to go there and endure and to try to reach this goal. But before Barents, you know, people were really just trying to get to the next trading market, you know, and that's what he was doing, but he accidentally became this first pace, face of the polar explorer. And what he became famous for was basically screwing it up. I mean, if he had done what he was supposed to do, he wouldn't have been stuck there for the winter. But by staying there and surviving and enduring and suffering, um, you know, it occurred to me, he sort of became famous because he had to live out the consequences of his mistakes. You know, he thought there would be an open polar sea. Every indication we have is that he thought that, and many other people along with him at the time, not everybody, but a chunk of people thought they could just sort of break through the ice that might be sort of right at the Arctic Circle. There might be an open polar sea that they could head north sort of over the top of the globe. And that, that there would be not necessarily easy sailing, but that it would be water, not ice. And, you know, so he set out three times and went into the ice again and again and again. And it's almost as if fate was saying, all right, you, you want this? Here's what you get. And so he did it. You know, he didn't take the first warning. He didn't take the second warning. And the third warning, when they tried to turn around and come home, it was too late. And so they couldn't get back. And so I think that for him, um, just this idea that uh, he followed this vision, you know, and the vision was wrong. Um, but he really dedicated himself to it. So there's a kind of a foolhardiness to some of what he did. Um, but, you know, there's something a little foolish and a little noble at the same time, I think. Absolutely. Um, and without giving too much of the ending away, just can you talk a bit, and, and then I'd like to ask you to read a little part, but, but first, could you talk about um, why his story is so relevant today? I think there's this moment in history where his country was this new Dutch Republic that had not been around more than a few years. And Spain and Portugal already had these extensive trade routes that they had locked up in the Americas and in the East, but with the Southern route going below Africa. And so the Dutch thought they had a lot of capital, they had incredible shipbuilding skills. Uh, and so they had this idea that they were gonna sort of stake a claim and if they could find this Northeast Passage, then they wouldn't, they were still at war with Spain in this moment. It was an 80 year war. So it was, his whole life was sort of swallowed uh, by this war, Barrett's whole life. And so they set out to the, to the North to do this. And it is the last moment. So we're talking the 1590s. It's the last moment that the high Arctic is not sort of permanently open to Europeans. So he will sail this story will become legendary uh, 
there's already a little bit of whaling going on. The whaling is going to explode next to this place that he just discovered, Svalbard, which is halfway between Norway and the North Pole. Um, within a decade, there's going to be tons of whaling start there. They're going to wipe out whole species in the 19th century, almost down to nothing. Um, and so it's it's sort of this, they're on the brink in this moment of it just being that there's going to be some colonialization and some imperialism. When the Dutch and the British are also staking these claims, the, it's sort of the last moment, the whole world is going to come under the power of this. And of course, with that kind of colonialism and imperialism, you have raw materials, you get to industrialization, you get to factories, you get to smoke, you get to cars, and you get to climate change. And so it's not like William Barrett's is personally responsible for any of this. But I see it as this kind of watershed moment, the opening of the high Arctic to the Europeans permanently. So it's never closed. Other people had sort of tried to go different places. Nobody had stayed there like he did and come back and made it famous by having been there so deeply and you know and so thoroughly. And then also just finding this perfect whaling ground, this, this area up by Svalbard really kind of unlocked a lot of things. And so it's, it's, it's sort of the last moment on an old world that like it was gonna be impossible to recover. And so I think now when I was up there, the changes I saw, um, the first time I was up there I actually went to Svalbard in polar night with the dog sled expedition and an ice cave had collapsed because we had rain in January. I mean, rain in January in the Arctic is, is just not what's supposed to happen. And again and again, I saw the sort of the, the, the kind of things that are not going to be undone, no matter what we do with climate, there's still a ton we can do, but I saw some of those changes that are going to become permanent. And so to me, it, it did feel a little bit like a full circle to see Barents at the beginning of this moment and us in some ways with the end of the Arctic as we know it. Not that there's not still a ton we can save, but there are some things that we're just gonna lose at this point. Yeah, and maybe before we do the reading, you, since this is a nice seg, you could talk about your next project. So uh, my, for my next project, I'm gonna sail with the same Russian crew uh, with the accordion player that you saw and some others. And I'm going to go even farther north. And um, this time I'm going to go uh, as a sailor with them. And uh, there's going to be a number of artists and documentary people aboard with this. Um, and I think we're going to be trying to document a bunch of those changes. And I'm going to be sailing because there's always this experiential uh, part of what I'm doing. And I want to sort of simultaneously uh, do a portrait of the Arctic where it's at now. And also uh, a little bit of the story of um, uh, what it means to try to become the kind of person that you want to be and to sort of follow that vision so that there'll be a memoir part of it. Um, but it's going to be tied up a lot in like what's happening in the world too. If you read the outside piece, you'll get a pretty good sense of it. But it is a little bit, um, how is it as humans that we can be in the world and how do we love things and how do we do things that we're afraid of? And you know, what is fearlessness and uh, what are the things we can do to take care of each other? So that's kind of a big challenge. But uh, to bring it back to Icebound, I can read a little passage from it if you were ready for that. Okay, so this is, this is the moment on the third expedition where they have already realized they cannot get home. Um, they get ashore. And one of the first things that happens, I'll spoil just this little bit, is the carpenter dies, which is not what you want when you need to build a shelter and you don't have a lot of wood. And so they built their cabin and they are making the final transfer over before they are going to spend the winter, they hope, in this cabin that they will be able to stay alive there. Returning to the ship, they surveyed its plaintive hulk planted in a field of ice, looking at the sweep of immobile sea. The last possible thing they could imagine at this point was that the waters would open up again and free the vessel. They picked up the spare anchor they'd laid out on the ice and coiled its cable back into the ship so that it wouldn't be lost under new layers of snow that would surely arrive. On the way back to the cabin, they carried the last of their food, leaving the ship empty of human life overnight for the first time. They returned again the following days, climbing back into the ship, gathering supplies for the small boats and clearing out the last of the equipment they wanted to bring with them. Once it was loaded onto the sleds, they got into formation and picked up the ropes with which to haul them. Suddenly, Captain Van Heemskirk noticed three bears heading from the far side of the ship toward them, lumbering over the frozen sea. He shouted to sound the alarm for the crew and to frighten the bears. The sailors dropped the ropes they were hauling and looked around for any means to defend themselves. 
Two halberds lay on the sled with the equipment to be ferried over. Garrett Devere picked one up and Van Heemskirk seized the other. They began to protect the crew as best they could. Luckily, the halberd was a distance weapon and didn't require them to fight within immediate reach of the bears. But with three bears, no guns, and two blades, they were outnumbered. While Van Heemskirk and Devere faced the bears on the ice, the rest of the crew made a break for the ship where they could shut themselves in below deck. But as they ran, one sailor slipped and fell into a fissure in the ice and got stuck. Disheartened by the armed men, the bears turned toward the fleeing prey. Devere was sure the fallen man was done for, but somehow the animals didn't notice or pay attention to the sailor on the ground, who lay mostly out of sight below the surface of the ice. They ran instead at those boarding the ship. The stranded sailor climbed out of the ice as Van Heemskirk and Devere caught up to him, and the three of them circled the ship to climb it from the other side. The bears in rage switched up their efforts to chase the smaller contingent. The crew picked up firewood and other stray objects, throwing everything within reach at their attackers. Devere and Van Heemskirk braced themselves with their lone halberds, realizing these weapons would likely be just as ineffective as firewood for killing the bears. The bears, however, didn't seem cowed by the assault. Instead, they grew curious and went to investigate the wood and other items that had been thrown at them, like dogs playing fetch. A sailor scrambled below to get pikes and bring back fire from the stove, but they couldn't start a fire quickly enough, making the guns aboard the ship useless to them. When the bears finally turned on them for good, one man threw a halberd at the biggest animal and managed to split open its snout. Startled, the creature pulled back and realized its injury. After a minute, it began to flee, alarming the two smaller bears, which turned to run after it. Once the animals were gone, the sailors took up the task they left off. In relief and exhaustion, the men harnessed themselves again to the sleds, which they hauled, bumping along without incident to the house. They'd moved entirely onto land, surrendering the ship to the sea. Not all of them would live long enough to return to it. Mm. That's, uh, it, it's, it's unputdownable, Pitzer. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, is there anything else you'd like to say before we open it up to questions from the audience? Uh, well, of course, uh, thank you to the Hudson Library. I'm really happy that they had us here and I'm delighted to be here with you and everybody. If you haven't read Beth's books, they're a masterclass in how to take really personal stories and tell huge, huge uh, globalization, uh, drug, the drug war, drug treatment, uh, the history of race in a small town in Virginia, but of course in the whole country and in some ways the world. Um, so there's a beautiful balancing act that goes on in her books. Uh, Dope Sick is the latest one and I definitely recommend that you read them. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not sure, I'm not seeing any questions, um, but I know Andrea would love, here we go, here's one from Linda. How did you feel about this story to research it for a book? Sorry if I mentioned, if I missed you uh, mentioning it. How did you find the story to research it for a book? And I think you did mention a little bit, but maybe there's a little another nugget. Well, I mentioned it, but I can tell you that, that in this Vladimir Nabokov novel that mentioned this mystery kingdom of Zembla that sent me searching for what eventually became these islands of Nova Zembla where the Dutch sailors were stranded. This guy in the novel, he believes he's the king of Zembla. And so I went looking, this, it's this unpopulated island. Like, did it ever have a king? Is there something that he could have been referencing? And I found this beautiful story. Not only did William Shakespeare write about these guys just very briefly, just in passing uh, in his play Twelfth Night, but these men themselves had a Twelfth Night party on the islands when they were stranded. They were so desperate. It was the middle of winter. They didn't know if they were going to survive, but they had saved up their wine a little bit. And they asked the captain if they could have a party. And they actually had this flour they would use to make paste for cartridges for gunpowder. And they weren't, you know, they, they had plenty. So they he let them use some of that flour and they made little pancakes. 
And so they had this feast, this 12th night feast. And that's, of course, the three wise men, right, is when they come. And so it was a huge holiday in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands at the time. So they were missing this biggest holiday, perhaps, of the whole year. They had it there. And the tradition they have is that you draw cards or you draw something out of a piece of food or you draw lots. And they drew lots. And the gunner on the ship became king for the night. And so somebody draws uh, uh, basically like drawing straws and somebody gets the short straw and gets to be king for the night. So the gunner became the king of Nova Zembla for that evening. And it was the only king of Zembla I ever found for my first book, but I became so entranced by their story that I wanted to, to follow it out and learn more about everything they'd experienced. Hmm. That's great. Uh, there's two questions I'm gonna put together because I think they're related to each other. One person wants to know how you're getting back to the Barents Sea. And uh, another uh, in a related question asks, what did the sailors you were traveling with think of your request, of your quest? What did they think of you, Pitzer? And why have they decided to let you go back with them? I don't know. You know, this is one of those <laughs> things that um, it's a little bit me because I had this like really strange childhood. I, I have no idea ever what people think of me. I was like kind of socialized like an animal. So I just do the things I want to do. And if I like people and think they're interesting, I hope they let me come along and I stick around till they kick me out. And these guys haven't decided to kick me out yet, but they've also been incredibly kind. And they were kind on the boat, sewing things for me, like helping make my equipment better, uh, teaching me things, teaching me curse words, which they don't really use, but I wanted to learn them. Um, and, <laughs> and they taught me how to steer, which I asked for. They taught me how to work the sails. I had already learned how to haul sails on a tall ship on my second expedition, but this was a much smaller vessel. So I learned a lot of the basics and I told them I wanted to come back and learn more. And um, I think that I'm a little like strange, you know, for them, like this 50 year old woman always doing push ups. now I'm 52, uh, always doing push ups and sit ups like out on deck and, and trying to drag the Zodiac in when maybe they were expecting me to just sort of sit daintily in the back until they dragged it to shore. But I have to say, I didn't know how they would handle me sort of doing everything hands-on and they were absolute princes. They were perfectly willing to let me keep trying things until I just fell flat on my face. So I, uh, I'm thrilled to get to go back with them. We would have gone this August except for COVID, but right now we've got a trip booked for the coming August uh, and hopefully we can all get vaccinated by then. That's awesome. What did they think of the book? I'm assuming they've read well, it. They just, they've been cheering me along, you know, they're on Facebook with me and, and they, you know, they'll write me privately and they see all the reviews and it's good. And I think they're excited. I don't know if they just expected I was going to come back and write a book that people would like, or if they were surprised, you know, it, there is some like cultural distance there. And my Russian, I have to say, is still pretty rudimentary, but they have been like so so kind and so encouraging. And I've met a bunch of their, like, well, not a bunch. I met some of their wives and girlfriends like on Zoom chats too. And they help me practice my Russian, some of them. And, you know, they send me like videos, you know, I should know this about Russia or I should know that about Russia. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's really heartening to be reminded that people all over the world are, um, you know, can be so generous and thoughtful and want that, you know, they love that I'm interested in the places that they go to. Uh, they're curious about what we think and do. And I think that, you know, the Arctic is going to require everybody to collaborate. And so the more people that are sort of connected who are interested in this kind of preservation and calling attention to it, I really think the better. That's amazing. Um, uh, Ashley asks, what moment in the book's story felt the most re relatable for you? Oh, gosh. Uh, I, I wrote a Washington Post essay you can look up about my last year, which was really quite a year. Um, my stepfather died. I had to get legal control of my mom, who has paranoid dementia. My husband had a brain aneurysm. I mean, this is just the beginning of parts of it, but it was a really tough year. And for me, when I was thinking about how hard this year was when I had my tough moments, I would think of the sailors, uh, I don't wanna to ruin too much, but they, they have to try to come home in their small boats, which is just astounding. You think something like bigger than a rowboat, but not a large boat by any means. And they have to try to sail more than a thousand miles in these little tiny boats that just are always getting dinged up and, and, and uh, leaking and having to be fixed and, um, and just aren't truly seaworthy at this point. And there were times 
several times in the story where they get to ice and they can't get through the ice. It's just, even for a small boat, it's too jammed up. And the only way they can proceed is to climb the iceberg, pull their provisions up, haul their provisions up, haul the boats up, drag them across the top of the iceberg, which is sometimes flat, but sometimes not at all flat, you know, haul it to the other side, reverse the whole process, lower the boats down, lower the goods. And they've got sick people that can't walk at this point. So lower the sick guys in and then wake up the next morning. And they keep telling themselves, maybe this will be the last time they have to do it, right? They're going to hit open water any day now. And then they wake up the next day and they just have to do it all over again. And, and they were so cut off. They were so isolated. They had only each other and they were all dying. They were all so sick. And so even though I had all this illness surrounding me and I also felt isolated. It was really clear to me. I had so many more resources than they did. I had so many, I was healthier. Uh, I had people I could call on. I had people I could at least talk to on the phone. Um, you know, they had none of that. And so I don't like to too much use, you know, suffering as inspiration. I think sometimes you kind of turn people into servants of your own feelings when you do that. Uh, it was one thing with the Holocaust I tried not to do. Um, but in this case, I, I will say I did find some inspiration just that they were able to get up and do this in this story. I felt very relatable that if, if they could do that, then I, I could do it too. Yeah, and you make a lot of nice parallels between what was happening back at home in that Washington Post piece, which I would really recommend. Um, Eileen asks, um, I read in the New York Times that you took three or four Arctic expeditions while researching your book. Three. What is your opinion about the increasing of Arctic tourism in the sensitive area and its environmental impacts? You know, I've been thinking about writing an essay about exactly that because I think it's a really important question. And there are certain kinds of wildlife, uh, some whales, for instance, that um, are, we suspect may be vulnerable to sort of having a lot of tourists around. If it's a fragile population, even if they're not being attacked or hunted, uh, it can be um, stressful for certain species to be exposed to a lot of people. And I think with climate change, we're gonna see more and more of that. So for my purposes, when I, the times I went to the Arctic, I always tried to go and uh, I didn't feel like I could just go for the book. And maybe that's a silly, guilty response and that this book will educate people about what's going on in the Arctic as well, because there is some of that at the end. But I just felt like I needed to double up and I needed to be doing more than just writing the book that I hope people would buy and read and, you know, that would benefit me personally, it maybe benefit the planet. Um, so each time I went, I would do other things as well. Um, so for the outside piece, I talk a lot about the climate change. So I was sort of reporting the climate change that was happening there as well. When I went on my first trip, the dog sledding uh, and polar night to the interior, I also, while I was there, reported out a story for the Washington Post about the northernmost town in the world and how they're already facing all these issues because of climate change. Um, they had thought that everything would be permanently frozen forever in the permafrost. And it turns out that their roads weren't built to thaw and refreeze. They're having mudslides, pipeline collapses. Um, they are already facing the kinds of stuff that we are gonna be facing down here at other latitudes. And so each time I've gone, I've tried to say to myself, how else, in addition to whatever I'm doing for the book I'm writing, can I immediately deliver some journalism that is gonna help make a difference for these things? Um, I had a chance, somebody invited me to do this one trip and I would have just literally been like a tourist on a boat watching a thing. And I just like ethically that didn't feel right to me. And I'm not making that decision for other people. Everybody is gonna have to weigh that for themselves. And there may be some communities where it's safe to do that, where they are dealing with their carbon footprint, they're protecting the local species. So I don't wanna say that Arctic tourism should never happen, but I personally felt like any trip I went on, I needed to be bringing back some immediate journalism along with whatever other research that I was doing. So I try to just double up and, and really serve awareness uh, and inform people about what's going on. But I think asking questions about, you know, the fuel it takes to get up there and what effects you have by being there, those are real questions that have to be answered. And I've been thinking about writing an essay about it. Yeah, that'd be a great one. Um, Linda wants to know when your next expedition is taking place. And I think you said August of this year, it's right? It's supposed to be, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, and uh, when you go, she's wondering um, how else would be, it, will it be documented, uh, film, video, blog, in addition to the next book? How else do you plan to? Well, the best way to follow me is always on Twitter. That's where I'm most active. You can also find me on Facebook. I post there some, but not as often. 
But if you follow me, uh, Andrea Pitzer, all one word on Twitter, um, I guarantee you I'm always like blabbering off about things on Twitter. And so you'll know when I'm going and you'll get updates. We will be out of range of any kind of uh, online stuff for quite a while while we're there, but I'll in the lead up and there might be a couple points at which we might have some satellite reception uh, that I could post in the middle. But if you follow me on Twitter, you can, you can see that. Um, but part of the point of who's going is that everybody on the boat is gonna be either doing science or documenting the Arctic. So there's gonna be people doing film, there's gonna be people doing art, there's gonna be, uh, there may be a composer, so we might be getting audio recordings out of some of it. Um, so the, the whole point is uh, I'm gonna be learning to sail and of course I'll be writing what's happening, but I wanted to bring people who, uh, who are getting funding to go themselves um, that would bring back the story of, of some of these places before they undergo the worst of these changes that we're expecting. Great. Uh, Linda wonders, what were some of the most interesting travel related incidences along your research journey? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, there's sort of the two layers of it, right? So there's the amazing things like we saw a polar bear at one point. Um, we ran into the walruses exactly where my guys had 400 years ago. We saw this mirage. And it's really, it's one thing to read in the account of this voyage from 400 years ago when they see a mirage and they don't know what it is. And they actually catalog the first sighting of this thing called what's now called the Nova Zembla effect. Um, and it wasn't believed for hundreds of years because nobody else had seen it. And it wasn't until other explorers noticed it and then it was sort of confirmed by science, people understood what had even happened. But even as a modern person who may be less prone to suspicion or superstition, um, it was really baffling to see the landscape like shifting like right before our eyes and like your brain tries to fill in the gap. So I'm like, is somebody building thing, something up there on that island? Are those smoke signals? like? there shouldn't be anybody here, right? There's nobody here, but your brain starts just making up stuff of like what this could be. And it was probably five minutes before somebody, and it should have been me because I knew this could happen, but somebody else said, wait, it's probably a, a mirage. And then and once we thought of that, then it became obvious that that's what it was. But in those first moments, it was really surreal. So we had the polar bear, but, but did not attack us. You know, we were not close enough to be attacked, thank goodness. Um, we had uh, the um, mirage, we had the walruses, we had a bird land on uh, the person who was at the wheel's head. Uh, that We had a lot of, because the, the everything is cold, so just above where you come out of the boat, but in still covered area, there's a little cockpit, they call it, and we had a lot of food there. So we had fish, we had cheese, we had eggs, all just like in kind of little bins, but just to the open air because it's cold, right? It's not going to go bad. It's your refrigerators up there. But the birds thought this was like, you know, they had found candy heaven. And so sometimes bird, a bird would land on whoever was driving the boat's head and we would have to like shoo it away. So there were all kinds of just amazing things. On a personal level, I was seasick for the first time, which I didn't expect at all. And I was really seasick. So this is a really choppy, choppy sea. Um, and I broke a finger uh, oh, just no. through my own idiocy. Uh, I slipped and like jammed it into a wall at the most inop because um, when you're heading, when you don't have a favorable wind, you basically have to kind of go sideways and then you cut back and forth in this zigzag that makes almost no forward progress. But the boat tilts at about 45 degrees and it's very hard to walk around in a boat that's like tilted. And so I ended up like trying to run to grab something in time to save it and jamming my finger right into the wall. So then I had to tape it up for the rest of the trip. So there were all kinds of exciting adventures, some of which I would rather not repeat. But when you go into really exciting <laughs> places, you have to take your chances sometimes. And I'm OK with that. Yeah. No urgent care visit for you. You just grabbed a roll of tape. Was it duct tape? Uh, no, they had actual, they did have some medical supplies aboard <laughs> and a pencil. So we just like splinted it to the next finger with a pencil. And it made it hard to do push-ups, <laughs> but. <laughs> But you still did, I'm guessing. But not the knuckle ones. I didn't do the ones where I do like fingertips <laughs> and knuckles. Oh, good sir. Um, Shikaro asks, when an author takes on these subjects, I'm always curious, how much does it seep into your daily life and how do you separate that? I think it's really hard. I was so immersed like on that last expedition. It was such an intense experience that when I came home, um, 
I was just kind of stunned for two weeks. There's a, a thing I mentioned in the outside article Walker Percy, the novelist writes about called re-entry. And it's this idea when you have these stratospheric experiences that take you outside the realm of sort of daily life. And that could be building something or designing something or making great art. And for me, it was going to the Arctic. It took me so far out of my normal orbit that the farther out you are, the steeper your re-entry curve is and it's easy to kind of crash. And making that graceful re-entry, I think as people, as a writer is one of the hard things when I'm deeply buried in something and for better or worse, and, and uh, Macy knows this as well as anybody, when I'm hot on a topic, I don't shut up about it. I just think about it all the time. I ask questions about it all the time. Anybody who will listen, I'm telling them about it. Um, and then when I came back from the actual expeditions, I was just kind of like shell shocked for a couple of weeks and just sort of processing everything that I'd seen. So it's, it's really, it is extreme. And I know like with some of the reporting you've done, Beth, when you're dealing with uh, drug users whose lives are like turned upside down by things, you know, or when I was writing the camps book, it can be difficult to go deep inside other people's lives, especially their suffering, and then kind of just, I'm going to go live my own life now. You know, you have to, um, you have to develop some tools to do that, but mm -hmm. I think you still have to learn to stay really sensitive to the people whose lives you're uh, interacting with and the people whose stories you're telling as well. Even if I actually been have a little years. slip of. Uh, it's one of your emails you sent me when I was so overwhelmed with how to tell the story of how we got to the place of this opioid crisis and so much pain. And you said, this is you being so kind. When you get back to writing, you know the drill. Thinking about the whole crisis all at once is exhausting. Just break it into pieces. Think of each piece as a story and do them one at a time. Sometimes I pretend I'm writing each section as a standalone story to make it more manageable. It lets me set aside the bigger tragedy, which is really great advice that I, I have it there, right there. Um, Janet asks, the goal of finding a pass around the Arctic seems like a useful goal. Did Marantz ever entertain thoughts of heading directly north to reach the North Pole at that time? That is actually in some ways why he's been referred to as the first polar voyager was because the goal of that third expedition, the one where they got stuck was uh, in theory, they were gonna head straight north from Norway. And that's where they discovered this island Spitsbergen that's today part of Svalbard. Um, but they got up to about a little over 79 degrees latitude, which is quite high and they just could not get any further. And Barents quarreled with the captain of the other ship and they decided there were two ships on this last expedition. They decided to split ways. And it was the reason they split was because they were supposed to just try to go over the North Pole, but Barents thought that it would not be possible there. And the other guy wanted to stay and try it for longer. So Barents uh, split off with his captain Heemskirk and they went east back to Nova Zembla where they were stranded. And the other captain, keeps trying to go north for a time and then turns around. But he shows up again toward the end of the book. So I don't want to ruin uh, what happened to that other captain on the third voyage. But the, the express goal of that third trip was why don't we just try to go right up over the pole? And it turns out there's a heck of a lot of ice there. So that was not a feasible thing. But one of the, thing I talk, one of the things I talk about in my book in terms of climate change today and where we're at is that by 2040, some are saying quite possibly much sooner, there is going to be no ice at the North Pole in the summer. Now there still will be in winter, but in the summer it may well be ice free and perhaps Barents, uh, Barents voyage uh, was not as foolhardy as he might look in my book. It may just be that he made the voyage 400 years too soon. Okay, I think we have time for one last question and it's from a, a familiar, wonderful name. Uh, the name is Bob Giles. He was our Neiman oh. Fellow curator um, and it changed both of our lives, I know. Um, and Bob wants to know, your three books are on disparate topics. Tell about the aha moment when you were inspired to write on each topic. So uh, I have to say Bob, uh, Bob was my boss at the Neiman Foundation and it was, it was a wonderful gift to be able to work uh, with him and for him. And he is the person that made possible uh, in many ways the headspace and the respect to write that first book. I was there and I had an eight-month-old child and a two-year-old child 
and I have been finding this amazing stuff in Nabokov's work. And I was not a Nabokov scholar by any means. And I had actually been away from work a little home with my kids. And I had found all this great stuff. And I remember sitting in Bob's office, actually, he may not even remember this. And he said, well, well what's valuable? What's important that you found here? And I told him, and, and he was like, you should totally go for this and let me know whatever I can do to connect you with people or to help you. And uh, it was just such a gift in that moment because I had never thought in the recent years of taking on, I'd never written a book and I'd never thought of taking on a huge project like that after being home with the kids. And for him to just say, yes, like this is so interesting and you should go for it. Uh, but it was the aha moment of knowing I wanted to write the story was when I was reading these books, I took a graduate level course on Nabokov while I was at Harvard uh, that year. And I just started realizing that he was referring to things that I had studied in like nuclear negotiations and treaties and stuff with the Soviet era and the Cold War that I didn't think anybody had ever really noticed in these books that were sort of ostensibly seen as scandalous, dirty books like Lolita. And I wanted to try to piece together that lost history that he had of his own family that he had actually kind of folded into these novels. And then for the second one, it actually came right out of the first one, which was so many people from Nabokov's orbit in Russia ended up in the Gulag or persecuted by the Bolsheviks. His brother ended up in a Nazi concentration camp. His father was assassinated in Germany and camps, concentration camps were such an important part of his life that I went to look for a, um, a history of concentration camps, a general one. How did they come into the world? Who thought of them? How did they grow? And I couldn't find anything. I could not find an English language book on the idea of a concentration camp and how it got started. So I decided I would write that book, which was again, a huge ambitious thing, but it seemed it really should be in the world. And then as I've mentioned for the third book, it was having discovered this little story of William Barents when I was working on the Nabokov book. And it, I mean, it really did stick with me for more than a decade. And so after the camps book, I was like, okay, if I can get there, if I can get up to the Arctic, then I'm going. Uh, well, thank you so much. There are a, a few little questions that we didn't get to, including, can you share your favorite curse word? But um, I'll just toss it back to you to say goodbye to everyone. And I know we just really appreciate all the effort you put into these books and um, how you explain these complex things that are going on and have gone on in the world and make them relevant today. I just, I just think they're all brilliant. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for coming out. I'm so honored to be here at the Hudson Library and it's just a delight that so many people had such great questions that I could be here with my dear friend, Beth Macy. <laughs> Well, the Hudson, on behalf of the Hudson Library and everybody listening tonight, I want to thank Beth and Andrea for joining us this evening. It was really an amazing talk. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else did it well as well. And it was a pleasure getting to know you both just a little bit. We look forward to reading your books and hope to have you back again sometime. Thanks, everybody, thank for you. joining us. Thank you so much. Bye. What a great night. Thanks.